Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. But we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com, and hit the Contact Us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. In our recent study of Paul's letter to the Philippians, I spent several weeks endeavoring uh, to do my best to carefully lay out the importance of unity among God's family. And one of the many things that we've learned during the pandemic is the fragile nature of unity. We also learned that despite the Bible's plea for unity, which can only be achieved as each one of us adopt the attitude of humility, that there are some who simply are not willing to obey the Scripture's command to live with humility so that they can live in unity with those who they profess to be their brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we learned in our study of Philippians, which, Lord willing, I will return to next week, the Apostle Paul understood the absolute necessity of God's people living in unity. I said, well, why is unity so important? Why is it stressed so much in the New Testament? Well, our unity, or lack thereof, is a direct reflection of the gospel. As we live together in unity, the gospel is adorned and God is glorified. And because God's glory is at stake, Paul labored diligently to help us understand that we need to make whatever adjustments or sacrifices are necessary in order to protect and promote unity among God's people. And I will remind you again, the goal of unity is the glory of God. Say, now why in the world would you mention these things when the passage before us this morning has nothing to do with unity, rather it addresses the subject of the Lord's Supper? Well, the reality is it does address the subject of unity. It directly ad addresses the subject of unity. I bring this before you this morning because Paul is concerned that the manner in which the Lord's table or the Lord's uh, 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 supper was being handled by some of those in the church of Corinth, they were handling it in such a way that it was literally threatening the unity of the church. So therefore, as he begins this section of his letter to them, he highlights the abuses of the Lord's Supper that had been taking place in the church. And these abuses, again, held the very real potential of creating unnecessary division among the people of God. Notice what Paul says in verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Why does he say that? Because there were those in the church who were through their actions, through their conduct at the Lord's Supper, they were actually abusing it. Therefore, Paul needed to remind them that the Lord's Supper was given to the church by the Lord of the church for the mutual benefit of the church. But that's not what was happening at Corinth. There were those in the congregation who were concerned only for themselves. They were forgetting. They were neglecting the poor members of the church. And so he says in verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. He says, when you come together, it's not mutually beneficial. Not everybody is receiving the benefit that they should be receiving when they come to the Lord's table. Rather, just the opposite is happening. You're eating and drinking, but you're eating and drinking in such a way that you're dishonoring not only your brothers and sisters in Christ, but you're actually dishonoring the Lord of the table. 
Look at verse 21. For in eating, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What's going on here? They, they were completely missing the point of the Lord's Supper. When Jesus, what Jesus had designed for their good was being so misused and abused that it was actually causing harm to those to whom should have been benefiting from it. The, the meal that Jesus instituted and intended for it to be a source of strength was actually anything but. So, in verse 23... Paul begins to remind them of the purpose of the Lord's table. And Paul reminds them that the Lord's Supper was not an ordinary supper and therefore was not to be treated in an ordinary manner, in an ordinary fashion. It was not to be seen nor participated in as a normal meal. When the Lord's Supper is served... As we partake of the Lord's table, we are to be mindful of the realities and the significance that is attached to the Lord's table. So this morning, there's there's probably four or five things I could draw out of here, and perhaps I will in coming months. But there's just one thing that I want to highlight this morning that uh, we need to pay particular attention to when we come to the Lord's table. But let's just begin with just some basic information. What is the Lord's table? What exactly is the Lord's supper? Well, the Lord's table is a visible proclamation of the gospel for both the sinner and the saint. The Lord's table speaks to all. The Lord's table has a message for all, but not all are invited to the Lord's table. Who then is invited? The only ones who can rightly come to the Lord's table are those who have believed in Christ, those who have been born again. J.C. Ryle said, it, referring to the Lord's Supper, cannot of itself confer grace, means it's not a means where you receive grace for salvation, where grace does not already exist. It does not convert, justify, or convey blessings to the heart of an unbeliever. It is an ordinance not for the dead, but for the living, not for the faithless, but for the believing, not for the unconverted, but the converted, not for the impenitent, but not for the impenitent sinner, but for the saint. So the first question every one of us should be asking ourselves this morning is simply this. Have I believed in Christ? Have I been born again? Am I in Christ? So second, why was the Lord's table given to the church? One of the catechisms of the church states that the Lord's table was given for the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of the death of Christ and the benefits which we receive thereby. Now, as we read that, we see that that statement is in perfect alignment and perfect agreement with what the Lord Jesus instructed us, uh, what the Lord Jesus said about the Lord's Supper. Uh, That's exactly what he said to his disciples as to what the purpose of the Lord's Supper is. The purpose of the Lord's Supper is to remember him, to remember his sacrifice of his body and his blood. And isn't it interesting that of all the things that Jesus could have asked them to remember, this is what he asked them to remember. He had a what? A one of a kind birth. He had a miraculous birth, but yet he doesn't ask them to remember his birth, does he? Think of all the powerful miracles that Jesus performed while he was on earth. Yet he doesn't point to any one of them and say, hey, remember that time I turned water into wine? I want you to remember that. No, he doesn't point to his birth. He doesn't point to any particular miracle. What he does point to that he wants them to remember is his death. It's so interesting to me. Because I think that teaches us that we as believers should frequently remind ourselves to spend time to think about the death of Jesus. We should frequently spend time, make time to think about the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. So that's all I want to do this morning. Before we come to the Lord's table, before we eat and drink, I just want to take a few moments and remember the death of Jesus. Now let's just take some time this morning and look back in remembrance of what the Lord Jesus has done. Look at verses 24 and 25 again. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, as Paul referring to Jesus, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So I think it becomes readily apparent that there's something specific that the Lord Jesus would have us to remember. He wants us to remember his body and blood. He wants us to remember the death that he died. He wants us to remember the sacrifice that was made on behalf of his people. And so every time that we come to the Lord's table, you know what we need to do? This is what Jesus wants us to do. Jesus wants us to take our eyes off of ourselves. Jesus wants us to change our focus. He wants us to lift our eyes, as it were, get our eyes, eyes off of ourselves, off of our troubles, off of the things that we're currently going through and look to him and to remember his death, to set aside the cares and the troubles of our lives and remember the sacrifice that he has made on our behalf. Now, why would Jesus have to ask us to remember his death? I think you know the reason why. We are so forgetful. We're forgetful people, aren't we? How quick we forget the death of Jesus. How quickly we forget that the very life that we lead, that we live, and all the benefits that we enjoy and experience on a daily basis, we only do so because of the death of Jesus. So it's not too much of him to ask us to remember his death. The Lord's table is a standing provision given to us in light of our forgetfulness. You know, some churches only bring out the communion table, the actual physical table, when they serve communion. But I, I want to keep it here so that every week that you walk in, what are you reminded of? What's it, what's it say? Don, what's it say there on the front of the table? So me, it's exactly what Jesus asked us to do. So remembering the death of Jesus helps us to remember who he is. Remembering the death of Jesus helps us to remember who we are. Remembering the death of Jesus helps us to remember what we need. Remembering the death of Jesus helps us in our time of need. Remembering the death of Jesus helps us remember what Jesus has done what Jesus continues to do, and what Jesus has promised to do for us in the future. Remembering the death of Jesus, this is such a visible reminder that God always keeps his promises. And we need those reminders, don't we? We need to frequently remind ourselves of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and who we are because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Again, I'll refer to J.C. Ryle. He wrote, The Lord Jesus Christ knew full well the unspeakable importance of his own death for sin as the great cornerstone of scriptural religion. He knew that his own satisfaction for sin is our substitute, his suffering for sin, the just for the unjust, his payment of our mighty debt in his own person, his complete redemption of us by his blood. He knew that this was the very root of soul saving and soul satisfying Christianity. Without this, he knew without this, he knew his incarnation, miracles, teaching, example, and ascension could do no good to man. Without this, he knew there could be no justification, no reconciliation, no hope, no peace between God and man. Knowing all this, he took care that his death at any rate should never be forgotten. He carefully appointed an ordinance in which by lively figures, meaning the, the wafer and the cup, his sacrifice on the cross should be kept in perpetual remembrance. He goes on to say, therefore, he did not merely leave them promises on which their memories might feed and words which they might call to mind. He mercifully provided an ordinance in which true faith might be quickened by seeing lively emblems of his body and blood and in the use of which believers might be strengthened and refreshed. The strengthening of the faith of God's elect in Christ's atonement was one great purpose of the Lord's Supper. So as we come to the Lord's table, the Lord Jesus asked us to Remember his death. And because Jesus instructs us to remember his death, we should, I'll say this again, we should frequently take the time to pause and remember and meditate 
on the death of Christ. And as we meditate on the Lord's words, I believe it will lead us to this conclusion. If Jesus asks us to remember his death, then surely there must be great significance attached to his death. In other words, there is a real meaning attached to his death. How many times have you heard it said, uh, someone passes away and says, it just seems so senseless, it seems so meaningless. Well, we can never say that about the, the death of Christ. There's real meaning, there's real significance attached to his death. If Jesus asks us to remember his death, there must be something significant. There must be something special attached and about his death. And you're intelligent people, so let's just think this through for a moment. Normally, what takes place at a funeral? Have you ever been to a funeral in which you were asked to think about the death of the one who has died? I, I don't think that I have. Normally, the focus of a funeral is what? It's on the life of that person who has died. It may be on their accomplishments. It may be on the life that they led. It could be the focus P, could be on those that the, they are leaving behind. Have you ever thought about this? What does the death of a human being actually accomplish? Now, I realize that there are times when people die and they donate their organs and they give extended life to a person in need or perhaps they give sight to someone who couldn't see. But the vast majority of people, they die. And who benefits from their death? Very few. But when Jesus died, literally, a number that we can't quantify has benefited, will benefit, and will continue to benefit throughout eternity. That's a special kind of death. Do this in remembrance of me. My death had meaning. My death has impact. My death needs to be remembered. Now, why is the death of Jesus significant? We could give answer after answer after answer. Let me give you just three things rather briefly. Why would Jesus ask us to remember his death? First, because of who died. Because of who died, it was the spotless Lamb of God, the Holy One of God died. He who knew no sin became what? Sin for us. The death of Jesus was not the death of an ordinary man. The death of Jesus was the death of an extraordinary man. The death of Jesus was the death of an innocent man. The death of Jesus was the death of a perfect man. The death of Jesus was the death of a man who perfectly obeyed his Father's law and his Father's will. No one else could ever say that. So his, his death is significant because of who died. Second, the death of Jesus is significant, is significant because of why he died. This follows closely on the first one. He did not die for his own sin. He had no sin. He never committed a sin. There was no crime that he could be convicted of. What were the words of Pilate? He comes out to the crowd and says, I find no fault in this man. Well, why do you want to put him to death? He's done nothing wrong. He's not violated any law. I find no fault in him. You know what? Truer words were never spoken. There's never been a more innocent man on the face of the earth. Pilate, nor anyone else, could find no fault in Jesus because there was no fault to be found. He was not a lawbreaker, but he died for lawbreakers. Jesus, by his own testimony, said that he came into the world to do what? To give his life as a ransom for many. As his birth is announced, what, does, what, is the, what is the message? He shall save his people from their sins. And how would he save his people from their sins? By dying for them, by offering himself up as a sacrifice without spot or blemish, by being led as an innocent lamb to the slaughter. 
So the death of Jesus is significant because of who died and why he died, but it's also significant because of who he died for. Who he died for. Would you flip to Romans chapter 5? Romans chapter 5. We'll read verses 6 through 11. Paul writes, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the good. Is that what it says? The ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the, what's it say? The death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus died for the home-wrecking prostitute he met at the well. Jesus died for lying Abraham. Jesus died for Peter who denied him three times. Jesus died for a self-righteous Pharisee named Paul. Jesus died for liars, adulterers, and thieves. Jesus died for those who broke every law in his book. Jesus died for sinners. And who amongst us couldn't agree with the Apostle Paul that like him, we are the chief of sinners? We're prideful, we're arrogant, yet Christ died for the prideful and the arrogant. Jesus died for the self-righteous. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for people like you. Jesus died for people like me. So the death of Jesus is significant because of who died, why he died, and also because who he died for, Jesus died for sinners. And the Lord's table is a visible, visible proclamation of the reality of that truth, that Jesus died for sinners. The Lord's table is a visible proclamation that the body of Christ was broken and that his blood was shed for sinners. The Lord's table is the visible proclamation that forgiveness is indeed possible. The Lord's table is the visible proclamation that the gospel encourages us, that strengthens us. That despite the hell raging all around us, that we are loved, that we are protected, that we are under his watchful care. The Lord's table reminds us of our salvation, our justification, our adoption, our sanctification, our glorification, that eternal weight of glory that awaits us. And so Jesus does what? He invites us to the table. Jesus invites us to come to his table to be served, to be strengthened, to be refreshed. But all of those benefits are only for those who have believed in Christ. And that's the whole point of this message was to help us as Christians to remember the death of Jesus. Here's, here's what I'm driving at. Do you have anything to remember? Do you have anything to remember? And by that, I mean, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Over and over again, God cries out in the pages of Scripture. He cries out to every sinner that we what? We must be born again. That we must be saved. And how is one saved? How is one born again? You know, the Philippian jailer asked Paul that same question. And Paul's answer is so simple that I'm afraid we overlook it. And we want to try and tack something onto it and say, Paul, it can't be that simple. But here's the greatest theologian in the history of the church. And this man says to him, what must I do to be saved? And what does Paul say? Well, listen, you got to clean up your act. Make sure you're not cheating on your taxes. Uh, make sure you're doing everything by the book. You know, just work a little harder. You know, be a little bit more spiritual. Did Paul say anything like that? No, he doesn't say anything like that. Paul says, we got to go get baptized first, and then we'll talk about it. No, he doesn't say anything like that. Paul says what? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Listen, I'm not discounting the need for repentance. But I wonder sometimes, are we putting the cart before the horse? Believe. 
the biblical command is believe. And you know what follows belief? Repentance and faith. And God forgive me for all the times that I've tried to get people to come in through the way of repentance first. Or faith first. When the Bible says, no, it's belief. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you, what? Will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Not believe in yourself. Not believe in your good works. Not believe in your self-righteousness. Not believe in your church membership. Not believe in how much money you give. Not speaking in tongues. Not in the service you render. Not in how many times you come to church. Not in any of those things. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And the question I put forward to you unashamedly, unabashedly, and with great passion, have you believed in Christ? Have you believed in Christ? And if you haven't, I plead with you this morning, believe in Christ. You know, there are plenty of times as a pastor and a parent when people want me to make decisions for them. And there are times when I'm more than happy to do that. Amen. We all are. But the reality is, this is not a decision that I can make for anyone. If I could believe for you, I would. But I can't. But what I can do is encourage you in the most strongest terms to not delay. Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to come to the Lord's table with me this morning. But more than that, I want you to be around the throne with me for all of eternity, worshiping God. So how do we do that? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved.